All right, so I'm Joe Gabriel. I'm happy to welcome you and just do a quick introduction for this event. Uh, I'm calling in from Seattle, Washington. Uh, grateful again for everyone that's just taking time out of the day to be here with us, to learn more about hand tracking and to network with one another. Um, we at the XR Bootcamp team, uh, we're really grateful for the network of guests that we have here. And I'm just gonna be presenting a couple things before we dive right into the deep details. So we have, uh, wanna present to you the Hand Interactions Pro Event Series. Uh, the Pro Event Series, this was created specifically for developers that are working with hand interaction design and want an advanced touch and a deep dive into this topic. So today, the 24th, this is the Hand Tracking Tips and Tricks webinar with Dennis and Roger. Uh, these are the co-founders of Holonautic and also the amazing team behind the Hand Physics Lab. Um, the 30th, we have an open guest lecture with the Ultra Leap CTO and founder. This is Tom Carter. So quick, quick story on Tom Carter. So a few years back, I was working at The Void and hosted this young, uh, impressive kind of technology group from a, a team called Ultra Haptics. And they came in to visit and they brought in a MacBook and this tiny little array of sensors about this big. They plugged it into their MacBook and they said, okay, put your hand over this array. And I wasn't really sure what to expect, but I felt these invisible bubbles, you know, popping up against my hand. I, I passed my hand through a invisible waterfall. And it was amazing just being able to understand kind of what haptics are able to do for us. Oh, let me put this in pre presentation mode real quick. Um, that is what the magic behind Ultra Leap kind of presents. It's ultrasonic uh, technology that's being integrated more and more into virtual and augmented reality. And Tom is going to talk more about how his team at Ultra Leap is enhancing you know, client-based and personal projects using ultrasonic technology and it is, uh, and, and hand tracking and hand interaction. And it is, it is fascinating stuff. So please come check that out. October 3rd, uh, we have our interaction design workshop, including a bring your own project segment. So again, this is uh, with Dennis and Roger that you're going to be hearing from today. The, the bring your own project segment is really important because you're able to, uh, attendees can bring their client-based projects or their personal projects to this workshop to get expert advice on hand interactions. So if you feel like you're you're kind of stuck, you know, with a, a certain mechanism or a design aspect, or you just want feedback from a couple of guys that really know what they're talking about, please bring your own project uh, in addition to uh, the rest of the workshop and Q&A that they'll be going in there. Uh, one quick note, um, for those that have kind of like uh, technical questions that are not answered in today's webinar, October 3rd is uh, is the perfect event for you to sign up at and you can just uh, there's different tickets that you can register for one is just the Q&A ticket uh, and I recommend that ticket specifically for those uh, with additional technical questions that are not answered from today. Uh, so following that event October 12th uh, that's the start of our hand tracking and interaction design masterclass. So this is an eight week uh, deep dive course uh, pro professional development for developers really wanting to take their hand tracking and interaction design skills to a, a much more professional level. Uh, we're gonna look at some of the curriculum real quick. Um, if you want to kind of look at these pro series events again with deeper uh, event details and like register for these, just go to xrbootcamp.eventbrite.com. Quick reminder for the 30th with Tom at Ultra Leap, the workshop coming in on October 3rd Live Q&A, bring your own project. And then ah, one last detail we want to make sure to uh, give some shout outs for our friends and partners over at VR ARA. Uh, we are supporting the hashtag XR jobs panel, uh, which is all happening on October 1st, right? And uh, so the quick rundown, you have these three sessions that kind of cover you know, the wide range of audience uh, and participants from designers, developers, uh, recruiters, those that are looking for jobs, those that are looking to network. These are great sessions that you'll be able to attend and bring some value to your, to your career. Again, looking at the masterclass, this runs from October 12th through December 11th. Uh, one interesting thing that we're doing uh, differently now with this masterclass uh, is we're 
the XR Bootcamp team is including a Quest 2 as part of the course materials uh, for all participants that are, that are uh, working through this eight-week master class. Um, we're, we're kind of following up this week with, from Facebook Connect that happened recently. Uh, for those that were, that were not able to watch Facebook Connect, it marked kind of an important moment, I guess, in interaction design and hand tracking. Uh, Quest 1, maybe we can call it, presented uh, some wonderful advancements in hand tracking and hand input and interaction design, whether that be for uh, accessibility or just extended use cases. Uh, it's really, really impressive. And we're seeing a paradigm shift in how developers, designers, and even service providers are kind of looking at interaction design, not just as this controller-based mechanism, but looking at more about how can we interact naturally with lifelike interactions? How do we use physics-based uh, you know, features within our game engines to really create like high fidelity prototypes and products for clients and for ourselves. So the, the masterclass really dives deep into, into these specific topics. Um, and super fast overview before uh, I turn the time over to Dennis and Roger, uh, go to xrbootcamp.com and you can dive into more of the curriculum specifically for the eight week masterclass. You'll have a program outline, kind of the week by week about what the content focus will be. You're going to have uh, lots of group and individual hands-on experience. I want you to understand this. It's not just uh, theoretical, but highly, highly practical and hands-on development. It's uh, it, the content is designed so that developers that are beginner, intermediate, or even advanced developers are able to uh, succeed in the class. Um, the curriculum is designed to be very professional and high quality. So please don't feel too intimidated just by the fact that maybe uh, you don't have the deep developer experience that you're wanting to, but if you have the drive and motivation to be a professional for hand interaction, hand tracking and, and uh, input design, then uh, it's a masterclass that we'd like you to consider. Um, again, more details on xrbootcamp.com about cost, tuition, uh, curriculum details. Uh, and just the one last thing I wanna point out application deadline, October 10th. Um, we're able to reach out to any of you that are interested with some discount codes. Uh, we have those, uh, Rahel or anyone on the team, if you can put those in the chat. Anyone that's interested either for themselves or presenting this curriculum to uh, your professional development team at your, at your work or in your company, um, we have um, some discount codes we're able to get you uh, specifically just for coming out to our work, our, our webinar here today, and being part of this uh, great network. So, turning the time back over to uh, the rest of the team, Dennis and Roger. Hopefully, you're ready to go. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but yeah, how y'all doing? Yeah, thank you, Joe. So uh, we're doing great. great. <laughs> uh, we were not expecting that many people, so that's really <laughs> really cool. Yeah, and we know we are very time limited, so we will try to jump. Uh, actually relatively quickly in. Uh, and we have prepared a small presentation where we try to summarize a little bit the most important aspects we learned in the controller-free area, as we call it, uh, since uh, you know the beginning of Quest 1, once the hand tracking was available, we basically jumped right in and were very fascinated by that feature set. Um, so maybe quickly about ourselves. So um, we founded Hold On Attic two years ago because we, we were so fascinated by that new medium. Uh, so personally, I graduated in neuroscience and biotech engineering, and I was always so fascinated by brain computer interfaces and everything you could do with that, that evidently jumping into the VR space was the, was the obvious choice for me to do. Yeah, I have a little bit of a multidisciplinary background from economics to bioengineering and computer science. And basically the first time I tried VR, I knew there was not much else I could do in my life than just try to exploit that technology to make something really interesting. Um, but enough about us. I think that's not why you're here. You want to know about hand tracking. So yeah, quick intro about that presentation. So we really want to focus on hand tracking, how we can use and trick our brain to really make uh, more immersive experiences, how we can really use like proprioception and other uh, physics-based interaction to really make uh, like next level experiences with hand tracking. And uh, one of the questions uh, we got asked initially, especially is why we even consider hand tracking because we have the controllers which work uh, currently so well and they're so well tracked why even consider hand tracking and we just know that uh, especially from the industry side but also from the users uh, from hpl that having no controllers and 
having just your hands directly as your input device makes it a lot more accessible. You don't have to manage all the controllers and it just gives some, some kind of a magical moment of presence when you see your own hands. And it's also the universal input device because we know very well if you try to support multiple sets of headsets, it becomes very complicated to deal all with, with all the controller systems. And every year you have something new coming out, whereas hands probably will stay quite similar for the next 100 years. And it's very uh, similar to like what we had on, on mobile phones. They also we used hands and there was basically a unified input and nearly every mobile phone you have nowadays used the same kind of gestures to interact with the mobile phones. And we hope a similar thing will happen in the XR space that uh, some common gestures or interactions will be defined because everyone has the same kind of controller input, which is just the human hand. And of course, there's less friction because you don't need to grab anything. You just put on the headset and you're in. It's especially helpful for new people that get into VR. Just give them the headset. They try, they immediately see their hands. So it's very interesting what they can do. So maybe to like go to the next step for hand tracking, like why is hand tracking so nice? Is because, yeah, you just see your hands. You just put the headset on and immediately, you know, okay, I have hands visible so I can interact with that. I don't need to like learn where the buttons are on controllers especially for people not used to gaming or to like those immersive experiences. It's just like less friction. It's a lot easier for anything to, to do in VR. So yeah, it's more intuitive, more immersive. And now let's quickly talk about uh, how we can uh, trick our brain or like use uh, uh, the knowledge we gain through our brain. And when we grow up, like how we can interact with the world and how we can use really that with hand tracking yeah. as a new input system. And the special important is the hands are actually represented in the brain quite heavily. So like a large region of the brain actually uh, is dedicated to the hands. And that also um, is probably one of the explanations why it feels so immersive when you see your own hands and you feel so, uh, so inside the experience because your brain basically focuses a lot of the hands and what they're doing. As soon as you have that eye hand connection where you're in VR, uh, you, you may not immediately be aware of it, but the, the immersion is a lot like uh, it's increased by like really a tenfold because you can you can know, okay, I'm, I'm moving that finger and I think uh, it's moving. So the immersion is a lot higher. And that's directly is linked to proprioception, which is uh, what we call the sixth sense of what we have, like, you know, vision, hearing and all of that. So basically it's a sense that allows you to like know in real time how your, bo how your body posture is. It's especially well developed for hands because that's basically how we interact with the world for anything we do, touching, grabbing objects. And uh, the cool thing about that is it's not perfect. So it's not really precise. So you don't know exactly like uh, close to a centimeter where your hand is in real time if you close your eyes. But I know, for example, I close my eyes and I put my arm like this and maybe Roger push my arm. I know even if I don't uh, like um, feel the touching, I know my arm is moving. I know where my arm is in real time. And that works for most joints in the body, especially for fingers. And that's really something that we can use to really make more immersive interactions. Yeah, and because it's only working through like electric signals back to your brain where the things is, you can actually trick it and you can experiment with it. And we will show you a few things which we experimented with and which actually worked very well in the, the next few slides. So up to now, most VR uh, experiences uh, make you feel like you're like some kind of ghost in that virtual uh, universe. It's like you're not really there, like you see that you're in, in another universe, but you don't really can interact in a natural way with it. And that in some way breaks the immersion. So like here, this is just a small example and uh, like the Oculus uh, home and the SteamVR home, you know, okay, if I push my hands inside a solid object like a table, I go through. So I really feel, okay, I'm just a ghost in there and I can maybe grab some object, but as soon as I really want to touch stuff, it doesn't uh, like behave the way I expect to. And that for the immersion, it's not ideal because you really want that if you push your hand in a, in a solid object like a door, that your finger bend backward because th that's what you expect to happen. So if you do that and you see your finger go through, immediately your brain feels, okay, something is not real here. here. It's like, uh, it's, yeah, it breaks the immersion. And the reason, of course, why it is done uh, in many applications, because it's relatively easy to implement, it's less glitchy, and it's straightforward, and also it's not really confusing to the users, because um, you can basically focus on the task at hand. And for certain applications, that's perfectly fine and works exactly as you want. Um, but there are also no limitations, like heavy objects or moving things around. It's usually very simple. Um, but of course, we 
Um, we also have the one-on-one -on -one mapping. That means wherever you see the hands, if it's with the controllers or with hand tracking, is exactly where they are in the real world, apart from maybe the slight lag which you have from the detection of the hands. But otherwise, it's always at the correct position. And that basically um, is not necessarily required to be immersed, that the hands are perfectly where they are. And we come to that uh, right, look, right afterwards. And here we have that for settings menus. We also use that still uh, for fast interactions. If something um, has to move very quickly, or if you really don't need any physics for the experience and you focus more on the functionality, then those, option, those kinematic interfaces are absolutely sufficient and also a lot easier to implement. So yeah, that brings us to physics-based physics interaction and why we should use it and how it really increases the immersion. Uh, the advantage of physics is that we, even though we know, don't all know like the complex equation of how it works, we know, okay, if I push an object, I expect it to move like using gravity, using the momentum. I, I really like can predict what the behavior of that object is gonna be. And it's something we also like to call as one of the first user interface basically what you see and you being able to interact with your body in a physics-based manner with the environment is really something we have all learned since we were born is that, yeah, I can interact with my hands, I can push objects and I can really like interact with reality in that way. And of course, uh, we made it's just a small example uh, where we have the ghost feeling is basically the hologram where, yes, you can touch things, but they're not really reacting towards you. Whereas in the realistic or physics-based manner, as soon as you touch an object in VR, it basically starts to react with forces to it. And that just feels a little bit more immersive and you feel more like playing around also in the environment and experimenting with because it feels more realistic and more uh, dynamic in some way. And uh, here we have an example of HPL of the very early version um, where you can see that kind of physics-based interactions fully in play. So yeah, you can see that if you press in the table or if you push a button, that uh, if those constraints are correctly, like realistically mapped, like a button has some resistance, has some spring, your finger needs to have the same. So if you press on a button which has some resistance, you should see, okay, the button is going down, but my finger also like being bent backwards. And as soon as you have those kind of little interaction, but it's like really what you expect it to happen, you as a human, as if you would in reality, and you have all those physics-based constraints, you really feel, okay, like I'm there, I'm interacting with that environment. And it's not only something visual, I can really touch it. I can really like be constrained by it. If I push an object, my body is being pushed back. And of course, there is that difference between uh, where your hand is for real and when the physics-based hand e is. And you can really push those limits, like there is like an offset, which is up to, I think some studies were done on that, like up to like 20 or 30 centimeters. Yeah. Your brain will not notice that your real hand is not where the, your hand is when it's physics based, uh, physics, physically constrained in that virtual universe. Mm -hmm. So you can really play with those values and like make those constraints help for the immersion. Yeah, and the interesting part actually about it is this, whatever your brain sees is actually what he thinks what happened. Uh, uh, Valve did an incredible study on that with uh, how to open the door, for example. And it's incredible what people reported what they thought that happened or what they thought their real body was doing when they saw in VR something completely different than what happened in the real world. And basically the same kind of principle is used here. Uh, and we didn't expect that so many people play so often on a button when they were experiencing like those physics-based buttons for the first time. Um, so yeah, the, one of the cool thing is you can like fake some physics-based interaction like making feel that some objects have weight, even though uh, with hand tracking, you cannot feel any weight because you have no haptic feedback, you have no resistance. I mean, you have some suits that, that basically help to do that, but for mo most users, they will just have the headset and hands and that's it. So many ways that can help to fake that is really like to like fake those constraints that if I grab an object, which is like two kilograms, my arm will physically going down because of the, the weight. So uh, it needs to fake, okay, my elbow is going down and I see some resistance. So uh, the, the heavier the object I grab, the more my, my arm will be constrained. They go down because of gravity. They, 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 they are pushed backwards if I try to push a very heavy object. And really using those can really make you feel like uh, you can interact with some like real, uh, real like uh, physics, uh, physics based object that really have some weights. And as soon as you have that, yeah, immersion is a lot better. And of course we hope that uh, someone will come up with a really awesome device to simulate those haptic feedbacks. Maybe Ultralip would be one of those. Um, there's also some um, 
some applications which experiment a bit like audio to simulate haptic feedback and there's one available on SciQuest. I would really recommend that you check that out just to see how you can potentially simulate haptic feedback with sound. And grabbing and pinching, one of the pain points <laughs> uh, HPL currently has. So yeah, that, what you can see in those videos is the current version with it on SideQuest. Uh, so it was the first version, so it was only physics-based. So of course, you still have a lot of fun being able to interact and push those objects and see that the finger bend back, backwards. You can grab some object and pinch, but of course, it's uh, limited by how good the physics engine is, how those physics-based interactions are like implemented. Uh, but yeah, you can see the limitations are it can be glitchy. Uh, if you really try to, 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 to stress test the system, it will glitch mm -hmm. out. It will not really do what you want. The, the finger can be a little bit like um, not uh, too flexible or not realistic. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, those are the limitations. That's why, um, as we will just mention, the, the next iteration will have a completely different system that will even improve that and have more hybrid interactions. And of course, uh, for example, one of the main limitations we had was the, the pen or a pencil that you can write or draw something and that didn't work. Um, but we'll come to that later on. Then uh, another way to do pinching and grabbing of things has been done, which is not purely physics-based, is has Alpha Flex has done one of the best implementations we have seen thus, thus far. And it's basically you have an object and you predefine how the hand should actually hold, help, be, be held by, by the hand, that object. And um, the great thing is that it feels very immersive because even if your hand is not really in that position, your brain adapts and because the visual sense overloads the proprioception part, you actually feel very much immersed. Um, the problem with that is a little bit that you need for each, each and every object, you need to define how it should be held. So that is, of course, a lot of work, um, unless you have a framework where you can do it very easily. But that is a little bit of the limitation. And also, you cannot have infinite amounts of how you hold that object, because there are only a few poses which allow you to hold the object as well. So yeah, they went for that solution because it's the most stable and that's what's needed for a fast-paced action game, of course, that it never glitches, that it always does what you expect it to, even though sometimes the hand snaps where you didn't want exactly to grab the object. Mm -hmm. But that was really uh, an awesome job they did and it feels good enough for, for, the, for the purpose of it. Yeah, for many games, also in, in the climb, for example, you actually yeah. go through things, but you don't notice it anymore. You can't, when you go back and memorize it, how it was, you think you interacted with the, uh, with the rock in a, in a realistic way. So this is the, the next iteration in the work that is for Hand Physics Lab, which uh, will uh, like do a, like a compound, like hybrid system between the fully physics-based fingers and interaction and trying to have the most intuitive and predictive system on how you can grab specific objects. Like a hammer, for example, if you only have physics based and you try to move fast and hit objects, it will fall out of the hand. It will not do what you expect to. That's why allowing to have a snapping system, which like more or less predicts what you're trying to do. And for very like common objects, uh, like a hammer, like a pen, like a scissor object, you there are like really precise uh, slots where you can grab them or like slide along that and really stay on those pretty fine position. That will help a lot to really make the experience more snappy, more stable, and a lot more intuitive also to be able to easily grab an object without having to think precisely and like have no glitch when you try to grab a small object. So that will help a lot. And that's really, I think, what will potentially be the best of both worlds trying to have physics and snapping working together. Yeah, because it's not just the whole hand, it's also possible that you have a few fingers still flexible and you can move them. So it's, yeah, we try to merge the two approaches together that we find some kind of middle ground where it's comfortable, easy to use, but doesn't remove any part of the emotion. Um, and now the viral project, yeah. So yeah, uh, let's quickly talk about viral. It's a project we developed um, for uh, our masterclass at XR Bootcamp, uh, which basically tries to explore and give tips about many, many different ways to use hand tracking for different kind of interaction from locomotion, from UI, from being able to grab objects, really try to, to find, uh, not to define a clear framework because that's really hard to do, but to like really find some good tricks and good ways to interact with many different ways and objects in that environment. So we built a project around uh, an interactive robotic arm mm -hmm. to like, at the end goal this was to, to have some kind of industrial ready project, which really have some precise functionalities and you can have a final goal. And yeah, of course we explore from the beginning from simple teleportation because locomotion is always uh, an important part for any application. We explore multiple ways to do uh, movement in VR and then we go through kinematic interactions where you uh, modify, like you interact with the menu, 
both in closed space and um, a little bit further away, like up to one or two meters away. Um, then also some gaze operations where you can look at things and then interact with them in a dynamic way. Uh, and of course, in the end, we uh, explore different ways how to control and interact with the robotic arm and play around with him. Um, and we try to build something where uh, it, you start really from scratch and build it on your own that you understand all the different mechanisms that uh, what you need to make something responsive, uh, animated, and basically use, use procedural animations to make things look and feel the right way. And of course, the, one of the main titles for this project was to introduce grabbing, like uh, both kinematic, simple way to grab stuff, still using hand tracking, mm -hmm. and fully physics-based grabbing as well, uh, using joints, using physical constraint. Uh, so we'll see there is quite of a gap between uh, implementing kinematic interaction and having physics-based interaction working in a not glitchy way that you can basically do what you expect to, and you can interact and you see that those different components or different objects react physically with the environments. So we explore those two ways of grabbing objects and also a physical constraint that you can use to control other part of the environment, also in a physics-based manner indirectly. For example, controlling a joystick, a lever, and that, of course, the final goal is to use those to be able to control the robotic arm purely with the hand tracking mm -hmm. that you can like aim at the target, make the arm go there, pinch it with the trigger, and really have some kind of finished product in the end. And now, as we are running slowly out of time, uh, we talk about a little bit how we develop uh, experiences or applications, um, and we call it like the holistic approach, because we uh, realized that you always should start small um, with, uh, with limited features, but even if you start small and do something simple, it's always good to add the visuals, um, some kind of animations and visual and audible feedback. Um, and it needs actually, if you want to judge uh, an experiment in, in VR, you probably need to add a lot more to it than you think. So audio as well as visuals are very important to judge if something feels right or behaves the way you expect it. Then test it very often. The most experiences we did in the beginning during the first year um, failed. Uh, we had so many ideas and we thought that would be incredibly awesome to doing it in VR and most of them just didn't pan out to be actually usable in any way, especially if you test it with, with someone which hasn't developed it and comes from the outside. Uh, it's very important to be sure that your prototype or your idea actually is very well translatable into VR. Yeah, that's something very general that is evolving, not only in VR, but in the whole industry, that the UX part of any application has a tremendous role to play yeah. for the end users. And in spatial computing, it's even a lot more important because uh, you need to be sure that people don't get motion sick, that it's intuitive, that when they have that headset on their face, they don't feel like, um, okay, what's the point of doing that in VR? Does it really make sense? Does it, does it really add some value to do that in VR? Mm -hmm. And any kind of the, the, all those kinds of interaction need to really use all the senses we have, like audio, visuals, uh, feedback, controls, all that needs to work nicely together before you're able to actually judge if it's good or not. And the other part is that we also have not defined like the golden rule book yet about how to do UX or UI in VR or AR. We are still in the beginning phase where we are still all learning and we define those. And no matter if it's like from Microsoft to, to many other uh, bigger companies which work on that, we are still all learning because it's so new and so complex and you have so many options. Um, we still need to learn and define how we do that. That means every prototype needs to be tested heavily before you can actually implement it and never be afraid to kill something. Because we killed most of our applications until we actually managed to get something which is usable and then we repeat the whole process. So maybe the key, key takeaways. So yeah, in VR or spatial computing in general, don't be afraid to think out of the box because that's how you will find really cool ideas that cannot be done anywhere else than in VR or AR. If it's basically an idea that would work better just doing it on a PC for a productive application, that really doesn't make sense to do it in VR. So really try to think different to come up with a like cool concept for VR. Also, don't be afraid to have crazy ideas because uh, the, the craziest ideas often turn out better than we expected, whereas the one which were more logical to do turned out to be quite boring or just not feasible. And yeah, the brain can be tricked. I think we show you a little glimpse of um, how you can abstract away from the real position to the virtual position that it actually can improve immersion. And don't forget to always iterate, test and kill and then repeat the whole process. So I think we're through, through. so any questions? Let's quickly look if we have questions. Q&A, okay. 
do we feel the weight uh, in this interaction? Oh, so Farhan, you wanna? Yeah, uh, I just want to help you. Hello, everyone. This is Farhan from XR Bootcamp. I just want to uh, uh, make sure that you can uh, look at all the questions. Maybe I can create it for you if mm -hmm. uh, it will be easier for you. Yeah. So let's start from the first one. I mean, we have a lot of questions, so uh, we will cover as much as we can today. If not, 3rd of October will be also good, especially for, for elaborate answers. I'm sure that these questions will help you to shape the, uh, the plan or program of uh, the principles workshop. So first question, do we feel weight in... So I think we lost you, but yeah, we see the same question. So yeah. question is, yeah, well, that's a, a kind of an open question because maybe it depends on uh, the user it's himself, like a uh, different percep perception. It's like uh, getting motion sick or not in VR. It all depends on the user, but you don't actually feel the weight, but your brain perceives it as uh, those objects have a weight mm -hmm. because you see, if you grab an object and it's heavy, you see that your hand is basically bending backwards then your brain will make you think it has some weight. Of course, if you don't have real feedback or vibration, uh, it's different, it's but it's already some kind of feedback your brain will do for you, which is yeah. really interesting. Perfect, perfect. So uh, the second question, when you push against a constraint, a controller can provide some feedback, but how can hand physics provide that feedback? Well, that's the it, same question. Yeah, it, it basically it can't okay. in the way controllers do, like you don't have the vibration um, or the haptics. Uh, what you can do is you have to basically do it with the visual parts or the audio part. Those are the two instruments you have to um, showcase like importance of objects or you kind of infer the weight of something if you can use those two. If you add the physics part to it, then you have also the visual part to uh, suggest weight of objects. If you don't do the physics-based part, it's a lot harder to um, transmit the information of weight on a uh, on in an environment of objects, uh, but you then have to probably resort to the audible part or the visual part to emphasize that in the application. Perfect. So I assume it is something that everyone is curious about. So maybe we can add um, a section uh, for mm -hmm. the 3rd of October to give them maybe a, a, an elaborate uh, example of how you implement that at least uh, in a design perspective, principles perspective, it will be great. So uh, Travis is asking, I'm curious for game engines, do these physics-based interactions change development pipelines? Is there a lack of static objects in this experience? And if so, how do developers account for optimization? Well, yeah, of yeah. course, <laughs> uh, because Currently, at least for Hand Physics Lab, it's only for mobile platform, so the Quest, so with hand tracking. And as soon as you have a lot of physics going on, mm -hmm. optimization can be kind of a nightmare. Yeah. So you really need to limit what's on the scene at the same, same time, already like simulating all the bones of the fingers, the constraint, all that take quite a lot of the performance you have available. Mm -hmm. So then you really need to limit what you can do in the scene at the same time. and. Yeah, as soon as you have a lot of physics going on, especially on a mobile device, you really need to be careful mm. what you have on the scene. Also, the physics uh, engine part runs on the GPU as well and has uh, impact on CPU. So uh, you, you basically have to be sure to test it early on. Uh, so not that you get uh, at towards the end where you test it only on PC and then you see if you cannot realize it on the Quest itself. So be sure to test those things early on, profile well, analyze your code well. Um, there's, of course, uh, solutions coming in the future with ECS systems and high performance and multi-threading, et cetera, but still for the current time where you can use stable implementations, be careful to test it early on if the implementations you do are highly performing. So Perfect. the next so, question is about the skeleton hands. So what was the reason to add that? Does it add any better sensory feedback? Well, no. The only reason was because <laughs> it was fun and cool looking. So yeah. It's <laughs> evident to add that. And because you cannot do that in real life, otherwise you have a problem. So yeah. being able to see your real life skeleton hands moving, of course mm -hmm. it's optional. You can change that in the, in the visual and the setups you want, mm -hmm. but that was something cool to add. Perfect. Um, so by the way, uh, Justin is uh, from our hand interactions expert group, Discord channel. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those who are not signed up for the interactions expert group, uh, we have great discussions, especially when there are exciting announcements yeah. like Facebook Connect, Quest 2 announcements. We are always coming together to uh, join the discussion, 
actually we have a Discord. Uh, at Discord, we have an after networking event that we will open up so everyone can uh, meet. Our our team will will share the details with you for the Discord invite after like at 11, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific time. So let's continue with the next one. In regards to haptic touch or lack thereof, will having no sort of haptic feedback when touching and grabbing objects potentially be jarring for players or will they get used to it? Or will it be enough to compensate with audio and visual feedback? I will also add one more question on top of this. How hand tracking will affect evolution maybe of humans? <laughs> um, I guess hand tracking is not so much from using your hands in the real world. So I don't think we will have any genetic ma uh, manipulation in the future based on hand tracking. Um, but what I think about the, the if, it's, if, if users get annoyed with it, um, that's a very important question, especially for AR and VR applications that you design user interfaces and experiences which are pleasant to use. Um, and that depends, of course, on the application you do. Uh, if you have more like an action-oriented thing, if the user has to do quite heavy movement for a short period of time, that's fine. Uh, but it's very important that um, you keep the user in mind and also the physical uh, body constraints of what is tiring. What we learned uh, from our own experience is that if you have um, motions which are always repetitive, that means you do always the same thing and use the same muscles over and over again, then it becomes very tiring. If you have experiences which have more varied muscle groups activated, it feels a lot more pleasant to do them and this becomes also less tiring because you have enough variety in there. So would definitely um, be careful with that, that you have not repetitive movements all the time to do certain actions. There, there exist actually many tricks to prevent those kind, uh, kind of things to happen. They do that in the Oculus menu, also in the uh, MRTK. Like the laser pointer you have at hand tracking is not pointing exactly following the hand path, mm -hmm. but it's actually trying to predict where you're going to look. So you have to do the least amount of movement possible to be able to aim at something and select. So it's sometimes not fully intuitive, but it actually helps to not have to move to move too much your hand. Mm -hmm. And for also for grabbing object in Half-Life Alex, they do that really well, that you don't have to bend on the floor to grab an object, yeah. but you can use telekinesis with just a simple hand gesture with, of course, the controller here, but you can use that as well with hand tracking yeah. to really like have some kind of superpowers. And I think personally that having haptic feedback or not will not change the equation much because it's more about the design of how you develop an application, how you design the user interactions, which makes it either tiring or not. Haptic feedback will not help tremendously with making it more convenient for the user to use. Perfect. So let's, let's go to the other question because we have a couple of questions. I don't know if we can answer, but what I suggest is uh, maybe 10 more minutes, we can um, answer as short as possible, but we will keep all these questions with our team. So make sure that it will be answered in the uh, workshop on 3rd of October. So Adrian asks, I wonder if using hand tracking also helps in preventing users from having VR sickness. That's a very interesting question, but Personally, I haven't seen any difference. No. It doesn't um, change. I mean, what is that you have not the thumbsticks? So smooth locomotion is not as easily accomplished with hand tracking. So that way you basically don't get yourself into a situation where you do locomotions which are maybe too hectic. Uh, but I think just seeing your hands uh, by itself, that's not the tactic to use. There are multiple approaches to prevent motion sickness from the cockpit to stationary objects to just uh, having no acceleration or limited acceleration mainly having constant speeds, etc. There are many tactics you can use to reduce motion sickness, but I think hand tracking will not be the major factor to help with that. We're still waiting for that small piece to put into your brain that it goes away, but um, we are not there yet. Perfect. So what do you believe the next step is for hand tracking in VR? Um, so, well, uh, that has been announced uh, by Facebook, at least. Maybe probably many other are in researching that uh, as well, I hope. One of the main issues with hand tracking now is that it loses tracking quite often, uh, often, especially when you have some weird position where the cameras cannot see how your hands is actually behaving. If you have all the fingers away and then you only see the wrist, that is really hard to track or hard to predict. And then the camera go crazy and the, the hands don't go where it's supposed to be. So they're apparently working on something really cool, which is the wristband, which is mm -hmm. using the, 
the, the muscle information with electrical signal that will allow to detect apparently very precisely, I don't know how good it is, mm -hmm. like the position of fingers plus if they use that as well to with the camera to track the, the wristband in real time like the controller, yeah, then you will, yeah, then you have the best of both worlds, yeah. precision of the hand track of the controllers and the finger tracking. Yeah, that little showcase was extremely exciting, but I don't think it will be next year or very soon because um, handling the data or the signals from that device to interpret it correctly is, is a very difficult um, kind of area to research and implement. Great, so a few more questions uh, before wrapping up. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples of basic ideas that did not work and crazy ideas that did work well? Maybe like Andrew is asking, maybe he's also mentioning like, what are the unexpected things happening positively mm -hmm. or negatively when you are starting experimenting? So uh, one thing which uh, we imagine to work better is if you uh, would older, overwhelm the users with different things to do. Uh, we thought that might be fun to have like, you know, that you basically in, on a mobile phone, uh, if you have a lot of things taken care of at the same time, it, it feels like there's a lot of things to do and you don't have enough time. But in VR, it becomes overwhelming and frustrating because you are so much in the experience and the field of view is still not um, as big as your normal field of view it feels like you're overwhelmed. And those kind of approaches where we supercharged users with too many things to do at the same time felt very unpleasant. Also, uh, we tried out basketball, multiplayer basketball, and there, um, because you always had to throw the ball upwards and you had to look upwards, that felt very painful after a short amount of time because the field of view on top and at the bottom is not as good as is in your normal view. So those things you have to really take into account when you develop something because you don't want to have neck strain and getting a headache after a short amount of time of using something. So the user interface should be like in this area primarily and not something where you look always up or far down to do things. Uh, and of course, many locomotion system we experimented with, uh, yeah, from teleportation, which is one of the most obvious one that is used in most app, but we try like being able to slide, accelerate, use your hands, use jetpacks. And most of them, as you can imagine, well, they sounded good and they looked good <laughs> on paper, yeah. but as soon as you try them in VR, you're yeah. in motion sick in less than two seconds and that doesn't work. So you, that's why you need to try very early your experiments. And but also many other way turned out to be really good and surprisingly worked. For example, the, the holoception was one of the really surprising results that came out that you can basically c control yourself in VR from a, an out-of-body perspective. And when you walk around, you jump. Because you're not in first person, you don't get motion sick, or at least not that easily. And that's still a project we're highly working on because it's, a, it's really cool, we think, that you can interact in VR from another perspective than just first person perspective. So um, one thing that I highly recommend, if you have a VR headset, uh, through Steam VR, just try uh, Holoception. And if you have also Quest, don't forget to try Hand Physics Lab on SideQuest. Uh, you probably, if you are already using SideQuest, you probably uh, see that uh, it's always like on the uh, most recommended apps. And it is uh, like, I, I'm sure that maybe uh, Dennis may give some tips uh, uh, to us like um, for the next generation of hand physics lab um, and uh, th that's amazing like uh, you should really try if you haven't so far so let's continue very quickly because i also want to make sure that we have graduates like alumni of uh, our previous master class and they are with us today i also want to make sure that they give some advice or some uh, maybe feedback of what how they they uh, actually and enjoyed the class and how they actually uh, benefit from the class and how they survived from the class. <laughs> it's also as important as uh, enjoying with the class. So uh, I think uh, maybe one or two more questions. Uh, we have 26 open questions. So uh, it is impossible to finish all of them. Maybe we can cover a few of them in the Discord after a uh, networking event. So please uh, join us on Discord. Uh, we already shared the link of Hand Interaction Experts Group um, link and also Discord invite. So Thomas is asking, how often have you tested your solutions with non-VR users? How have you gone about finding testers and organizing user tests? 
That is one of the hard things, uh, to be honest. I mean, maybe it gets better with the Quest 2 where more people get a VR headset, but it's true that um, it's, we often like organize, um, you know, some evenings where we invite a lot of our friends which work in completely different industries to come over and test it on our headsets. So it's very hard to find uh, good test users which provide with good feedback um, on how they feel because it's very important that you can observe them, that you see how they use your application um, because to see where you failed in implementing or making things obvious. So that is definitely a lot harder than, you know, with mobile phones nowadays, you can basically ask anyone on the street to quickly test it out. With headsets, you still probably need to organize it, but maybe that gets better in the future. Perfect. So um, <clears throat> I think uh, let's go to maybe uh, give some um, stage opportunity for our alumni. But I'd like to also share with you that if you're a designer, we are enthusiast, and if you really would like to get end-to-end uh, -end <clears throat> understanding and knowledge about spatial computing mindset in terms of advanced interaction and hand tracking, uh, 3rd of October will be the best way for you to gather all this knowledge. We know that um, there are many questions. We also have our trainers have also many questions that has not been answered yet, but at least uh, we are happy to answer the ones that we have at this find the solution that is uh, that we are comfortable with. So this is something that I would like to uh, suggest to everyone. So uh, maybe um, now I think uh, Diego and I is here. Uh, if possible, maybe we can have uh, their feedback and their maybe a few words about the class and maybe some warnings. Uh, Ian, can, can you unmute? Yes, yes, perfect. Let's unshare the screen so we can see him. Yep. Hello. Um, my name is Ian McKenzie. I'm a software engineer at Samsung Neurologica, and I'm an alumni of the, the most recent hand tracking class. Um, I guess my advice to anybody that's uh, either interested in the class or currently looking at it would be uh, if I could jump back in time and say to myself is I was kind of on the fence about whether I was going to take it or not. And it's uh, don't be on the fence and don't be intimidated about it because uh, I wasn't sure if, if it was something that would be over my head or not. Um, I'm not the best Unity developer in the world, um, but the course is definitely something that's at an accessible level uh, and they guide you through the whole process, starting right from uh, getting up into the basics of, of Unity. Like in the first week, you'll just be like pinching and making a cube. And then by the end of it, you'll be controlling robot arms with your hands. And it's, it's awesome and crazy. And th there's benefits beyond just, um, learning the hand tracking technology. That's definitely what I, I joined it for, but I ended up getting more than I really expected. And um, the, the number one is that it's improved my developer skills a lot. Um, Dennis and Roger, you guys are incredible programmers. <laughs> um, and so I learned a whole lot just even by combing through like the code base and going through the examples and uh, it pushed me a lot. And then the other huge benefit that I got out of this was um, uh, kind of joining this community of people that are pushing forward into the, the new technology of tomorrow. Um, and to the point where I'm saying hi to 127 people right now. <laughs> so okay. if, if you're on the fence about, about potentially taking the course, I highly recommend it. It, uh, it definitely has its value. It's, it's had its value for me. And um, I think you'll enjoy it if you do choose to, to join in. I have I have one question. I uh, what are the most challenging parts that while you are doing assignments of the pro or the project, uh, what what is your recommendation? If I want to take this course, uh, what is the best way to to prepare by like a psychologically and even knowledge base? If um... Do you mean prior to the course or during the course? Prior, prior to the course. During prior, yeah, we can also talk about that, this eight weeks uh, uh, program, but uh, be prior to the course first. Prior to joining into the course, uh, it would definitely help a lot to continue following along with this hand tracking developer event. It'll help get you into the mindset that you need to, to like be working with uh, spatial computing and do all this hand tracking work. Um, 
and then also um the, i think that the the course is reasonably accessible um it, i do recommend if you've never worked with unity before to possibly jump into unity and make a couple small projects and whatnot just understand the basics of getting around that software and um being able to work in it um I, I've been doing game development for a little while, so it was good to get through. But if you've never touched Unity before, I would highly suggest downloading uh, a copy and follow some Bracky's tutorials or something and just, just start to get into the flow of using that software. Perfect. Um, I mean, as far as my, uh, my personal point of view, the, the most challenging parts was also not on, on the Unity part, but also the... Um, fundamental skills like physics, mathematics, algorithm, and some programming skills. Uh, this reactive programming part, maybe Diego is with us. Maybe he can introduce himself and a little bit go to that part, which I knew that he, he, he has challenging times, but then he enjoyed. So happy to hear more, Diego. Um, hey everyone, how's my audio? Is it good? Okay, perfect. So yeah, as Farhan said, um, I've been also a game developer for a while. And right when we started, uh, first week, week zero, reactive programming, I was like, wow, I have no idea what they're talking about. Like there's a lot of things to learn uh, when it comes to the course. Uh, um, when it comes to better practices, when it comes to how to properly, like it really helps your developer skills, even if you are already knowledgeable, is what I'm trying to say. Um, but it is a fun challenge, definitely. I would also recommend anyone uh, for to fully to take the course. It's it's well worth it. Uh, the mentors are always there for you. They always give you feedback. I distinctly remember a lot of instances where I would do something and then submit my assignments, and the uh, and the mentors say, "Oh, and you can also add this to make it even better." So it's always like this continuous process of self improvement that I was really a fan of. Uh, Diego and Ayn is actually uh, one of the, uh, like we have half of the students who attempted all the assignments because we have a very nice open buffet of assignments every week from easy, uh, medium, hard and hardest. So uh, Diego and Ayn is actually one of the few that can actually attempt all the um, assignments. And uh, of course, the more that you uh, push your limits the more that you get from it so um one last question for you diego and i and uh, how you are using right now i think it's a while ago right we you have graduated um over one month one and a half month ago so how does it affect your current um client job or your projects that's your actually a perfect question uh one of the things that i really like is we learn fundamentals not only from hand tracking but other related technologies and I'm currently using Final IK, which is one of the things that we use uh, to make a procedural animation system for a living creature. So it's uh, actually like, it will open your possibilities far past hand tracking itself. How about you, Ian? So I had a, a small user interface project that I was working on and it, it got a little bit scooped up, so I can't go into depth on that but the thing that i am excited about using it is i just today unpacked my new haptic device um and so i'm looking forward to using some of the uh the user interfaces that we learned to develop for the class to be able to easily test this in vr and adjust values and be able to feel it in real time as i'm uh working with this wow amazing i really want that <laughs> i'm i'm just <laughs> if if anybody's curious, this is um, the the Wooser haptic devices. There's both a, a small strap that you can wear on your chest, and then I have a like a PFD sized one that I'm looking forward to. Oh, my camera's yeah. removing it. But yeah, I'm looking forward to to messing around with these and using uh, what I got out of the class for that. Perfect, perfect, great. So um, we have uh, less than five minutes left. So. There are several questions regarding the masterclass, which I would like to sh uh, answer very quickly uh, because um, maybe in the Discord uh, after networking event, after party networking event, there might not be everyone here who want to who, might, who may want to hear uh, the answers. So the the principles class is um, half day workshop. 
uh, including bring your own project. So you can, as Joe mentioned in the beginning, you can bring your own project and ask for, of course, overall advice. We cannot maybe go uh, sit down with you and start coding in this uh, limited four hours. Uh, but uh, for, for every project, uh, our trainers will uh, allocate time. You will submit your project beforehand and you will get feedback specific to your project. So um, 3rd of October, you have to commit only um, four hours um, for the whole workshop. And the, the pricing is changing from uh, $100 to uh, $200, I think, right? So uh, there are several tickets because some people may not prefer to take the bring your own project part. Uh, for the masterclass, eight week masterclass, um, we have, of course, like uh, discount code, which is uh, available till uh, Monday. Uh, so you can definitely use these codes. And uh, for this uh, class, master class, it is 4,500 uh, US dollars and uh, quest two included for the regions which is applicable. If you're in your region, it is already sold out or if it is, um, if it is not available officially by Facebook, we are creating an, an additional uh, $300 uh, discount for, for this price. And the commitment number of hours Aviv asked this question. It is per week. I mean, uh, you guys can, can answer much nicer, Ian and Diego, because I think it is really depending on how much coding and unity knowledge that you have previously before the class. Uh, but I can definitely say that the lecture and mentorship takes around six hours to watch and to, uh, to, to interact in the mentorship hours. So um, on top of that, of course, Assignments is a completely a new uh, part that you have to actually um, commit because assignments is very critical for us. We are, uh, we are starting the course together. We are learning together, pro creating the project, hacking together and finishing the project and pitching together. So uh, it's not a self-paced program. So don't expect like Udacity or Udemy type of uh, self-paced program. We are, if you are committed enough, you are finishing the project like any other students. Um, so in terms of assignments and the overall commitment, Ian, Diego, do you have any advice or any uh, estimation? Well, I really like the way that the course was structured. Like all the materials are available to you at any time. So you can just uh, see them whenever you need. And the heavy workload, you can actually even push it to the weekends like I used to do. Um, because I mean, having a full-time job and also doing this is, a bit of a challenge, but I would challenge that's worth taking, um, I would say. But it is completely possible. It's just your own commitment. That's the only thing stopping you. So um, two great things about the class is that the organizers do a, a great job of making sure that it's flexible. So even if you have a full-time work schedule, you can definitely make this work out with both your regular full-time work and getting through this course. Um, I think timing will be variable depending on how much Unity experience, how much programming experience you have. If you have more Unity and programming experience, obviously you'll be able to get through it faster. Um, and then the other thing that is great is that there's different levels of challenges for every week. So you might get four assignments every week ranging from easy, medium, hard, and extra hard. And the further that you push yourself on those levels, if you choose to go the extra mile and spend the extra hours figuring it out and cracking these, these hard challenges, you're going to get more out of the course. But those higher levels are optional. If you don't have time one week, uh, you don't necessarily need to tackle it then. Or even there's opportunities. If you, if you miss something, you can go back and attempt it later, maybe once you've been more acclimated to um, working within the course. So it's very flexible. And I think that it's manageable, even if you do have full-time work. Okay, great. Um, our trainers, do you have anything to add for the commitment part or for any piece of advice for those interested? Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think it's, we try to make it flexible, right? We try to have challenges which when you listen to the theory and you went through the class that you could easily implement in a limited amount of time because we knew not everyone uh, can spend 40 hours a week, um, you know, focusing on the class. 
but we also wanted to provide basically um, a high amount for flexibility to go really far and even those which are maybe very familiar with Unity that they have challenges ahead where they can tackle and we are there to support them which want to push themselves further down. Um, and I ho apparently it didn't work out that badly from the two comments we got that it's actually, we managed to get in, in between where we had some which had a bit of a hard time to keep up. And even though we had never had anyone which was so advanced that we had a very easy time doing the hard, hardest challenges up to now. So we're still waiting for someone just like, oh, it's too easy. We still have a few assignments in stock in case we have someone which brushes through everything which are even harder, but we limited the difficulty to a certain degree at some point. Um, and yeah, it definitely needs a commitment. Like if you don't watch the videos, you don't come to the live uh, sessions we have and don't ask mentors like questions. I think you will lose out on a lot of value which you could have. And so we're there for you, but be sure that you also can commit the time and plan ahead for those eight weeks because it's a bootcamp. So it's, it's really tough to a certain degree to really be there and listen to the lectures and ask questions uh, because we will answer anything, any questions we get. Um, and we hope that you really but if you take the classes, you also are prepared to invest time in it that you get the most out of it. And yeah, we really try to make the eight weeks uh, on a progression basis that it starts slow and more and more you by topic, you will learn new stuff, more complex over every week. Um, and especially the, the assignments, we try to make them really like satisfying and fun to, to, to implement and work with. So you will learn like how can, you can make breakable objects. Uh, there will also some really weird stuff you will have to do, <laughs> like how can you make a remote controlled vacuum cleaner with a hand tracking that you can grab objects on the floor. So we, <laughs> we really try to make them as fun and uh, like uh, and, um, uh, to really make you like interested and like motivated to implement them because in the end it's satisfying if you manage to build because uh, you, you start from, you have different levels as mentioned, like you have easy, medium, hard and even harder and but if you really much manage to do all of them they go they, they some of them are connected to each other and in the end you have something really cool if you manage to do them all yeah and it's also how i learned the best and how we learn the best when you actually you have something already there and then you want to add a feature to it and that usually motivates you a lot to even go through the code which was maybe presented that you also understand that one better because you want to extend it so that was the idea behind um and it seems that mm, nearly all of the students really could benefit from the science we actually were surprised how many of you enjoyed the assignments and said that was very valuable. So that we're very pleased with because it's hard to make good assignments which are not like too hard and not too easy. And we're glad how it actually turned out. Perfect. So um, there is uh, two questions that I can answer very quickly because we have to close and we will start the Discord uh, event. And um, for those who missed the, uh, this rec recording or this live session, um, we will we will have the recording available to be shared in the Discord channel. So please join there. We will share the recording there. Um, the second thing is for the scholarship, we have uh, installment plans. A scholarship is like uh, usually like we are providing discounts and uh, we are happy to also provide Quest 2 in this class, which I'm sure that Ayn and Diego is a little bit jealous of you <laughs> because they don't have this opportunity um, but uh, sorry guys in your time the uh, quest 2 was not available so and not accessible that much so we we, we really um, we are really happy to, to provide uh, to the regions that is available and uh, I would like to thank to everyone Joe our trainers Hornetic team I am Diego and everyone this is just the start of pro event series we will be together I'm sure that Ultraleap CTO, uh, we will have a, a great discussion um, with our trainers will be there as well. So, but we are, don't worry, we are taking all these questions uh, in our database. So we will make sure that it is being answered throughout this, uh, this uh, pro event series. So um, happy to see you in the next um, Ultraleap webinar or guest lecture, which will be accessible to everyone. So just join us in the Discord and uh, follow. And thank you everyone. Thank you, our team, and see you uh, in a bit. I think our uh, team is sharing the Discord, um, Discord uh, channel. There are some people saying that I'm sold. See you in the course. I hope that we will see you in some of you in the course so happy to 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 have you in the following uh, events
See you in the Discord channel. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.